do a little bit of a sync. Three, two, one. A professional here. Yeah. <laughs> so, hello everyone and welcome to a special episode today. I don't know which camera I'm looking at because there's so many of them. And I am joined here with the one and only Nigel Marvin. How Hi. are you doing? Nice to meet yeah, you. Nice to see you, Jim. I'll tell you what, in my life I'd never met a European beaver and you're, oh, the, third, the, you're the third <laughs> European beaver I've met in a month because I, I, they've been reintroduced to Devon, so oh, I watched right. them there, then I went to Slovakia and saw a family of six kids. Oh. I'm in Slovakia, brilliant photographer. So you are the third European beaver this year. Devon, it's Devon. a good place Devon. to Devon see them. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. The river otter, and they're guaranteed. Love, you'd, otter? you'd enjoy seeing them, yeah. Is there not a river beaver? No, uh. it's the river otter, <laughs> which is a bit strange, because when I, I talked about it and I said otter rather than beaver, but got mm. confused, but no, they're in the the River Otter. So if anybody doesn't know who Nigel Marvin is, you've starred in, um, what was it? Well, Prehistoric Park was the one of the last dinosaur prehistoric things you did, but there was- yeah, giant, land, of, land of Giants land and of Giant giants. Claw. But not only have you done dinosaurs, you've done a lot of other documentaries. You've been all over the world, really. Uh, and I'm curious to, how did this all start? Yeah, no, my day job is working with real animals. So I've yes. done, most recent series was Wild Central America, went to Guatemala to see Guatemala and beaded lizards and whales in Costa Rica and all of those sorts of things. Hummingbirds, I love hummingbirds, you know, they're marvels of miniaturization. So I love being filmed with hummingbirds. And I love seeing new animals. People always say, are oh, you gonna run out of ideas like you with paleontology? No, we're not. There's so many new discoveries being made all the time. And uh, you know, in the Philippines, got extraordinary wildlife. I dive with thresher sharks. So they're amazing oh, wow. sharks with a long tail and they use it like a scorpion to smash through shoals of fish and then they eat the fish they've stunned with their tails. So I saw them for the first time in the Philippines. I love all of that, but of yeah. course, all of us would love to travel back in time. If we could really see a T-Rex or a sauropod, it would be fantastic. And it's great because the people that watched my prehistoric shows, they then watched the wildlife shows and the yes. young people are getting an interest in the natural world. Central wow. America was the most recent, Central. Philippines was the one before that. Right, because that's the one that has a big eagle in it. Because I remember seeing that, I was like, I've never heard of this bird before. Yeah, no, the <laughs> Philippine eagle, it used to be called the monkey-eating eagle because it catches oh, really? monkeys. So it's a, it's a huge bird and it's the national bird of the Philippines, but oh. on the verge of extinction because of the loss of habitat. forest habitat. Big predators like that need a vast area. Very sad, but hopefully it will be protected. I think lots of Filipinos now are very proud of their eagle and oh, they'll, well, so they'll do they anything be. to protect it. I think it's amazing because people in the UK don't know that, you know, we have the basking shark, for instance, in our waters. Yes. They think we don't have any sharks at all. Yeah. I think more yeah. people knew about it than they'd be proud of it and want to protect it. And yeah. Like no, and, and also one of them, they had an, 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 an injured Philippine eagle, oh. a Manny Pacquiao. Oh, really? That's what they called was it? Its, was, no, he was its ambassador. So oh. he followed it and saw it released back into the wild. They managed to rehabilitate it. And I just want to, I just want to hold the hand of the man who's survived countless dinosaur encounters. Ah. <laughs> I mean, it was the Walker with Dinosaurs uh, aquatic special where at the very end there was a family of mosasaurs that closed in and sort of left on a cliffhanger. Yes. Do we do we know what happened there at all? I, we, we, I, well, we definitely survived. I'm definitely here. And I survived primeval as yes. well. Yes, um, that was another one. It was the Giga, was G it? Giganotosaurus, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I saw, people are still wondering whether I'm, st you, you can know whether you're sort of semi-famous <laughs> if, if you look up as, as Nigel Marvin died. <laughs> yeah, I think you've got that your, on yours as well. Oh, they um, do as well? Yeah. Oh dear, I don't so know what I did. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> Steve Irwin used to get that all the time, you know, is Steve Irwin mm -hmm. obviously has sadly passed away. But yeah, no, I made it. And Sea Monsters was before Prehistoric Park. So yes, it I was. obviously survived and carried on to do Prehistoric Park. I, I remember, because I've been doing YouTube for so long, there was somebody who made a, uh, a video. It was like a conspiracy. It was like, oh, he could have survived. He could have followed the Giga back into the, uh, the, ta the anomaly or whatever it was. <laughs> and then that's how prehistoric park sort of happened. So there's this whole timeline. I don't know if you're aware of it, that people are theorizing, but. Yeah, no, fun. No, Tim, Tim Haynes. He was the executive producer on Prehistoric Park and on um, Primeval. He invited me to go along for three days to b be myself oh, in right. Primeval. So that was great fun working with the actors and everything, because obviously 
I'm not an actor, I'm a, a natural history um, presenter. Yes, so. and that's how it worked so well, you know, Prehistoric Park and the walk with Dinosaurs, because the way you presented it was such that this was real. And you, you know, you did go back. There's so many kids watching, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think because I go hands on with big snakes, hands on with, with cobras and venomous snakes, you know, hands on with crocodiles, people believe that I would know how to deal with a dinosaur. And in fact, it's so real, I still get people writing in saying, where is Prehistoric Park? We'd like <laughs> to, want to go and see it. And I think when I'm an old man, Framestore, who did the Harry Potter movies, they did all the computer graphics for Prehistoric Park. It's so real, when I'm an old man, I think mm. I will believe I did travel back in time and meet dinosaurs. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, you feel a little silly doing it, first of all. Yeah. You know, I remember Crassigerinus scoticus, that one, uh, you know, in Carboniferous times, and it was a, a fossil that's only been found in Scotland and Amphibian. Oh, right. And I'm wrestling with that with, for the first time, and it's animatronic, and the animatronics, they're very expensive, you know, like a small car, and the thing's mm. blinking. And you're thinking, this is ridiculous. I'm wrestling in a swamp in Florida. But when you see how they put it all together, I mean, it's completely unbelievable. And Sea Monsters was 17 years ago now, but it's really stood the test of time. There's still, still get emails uh, and, and things every week of children dressed as me saying, we want to be you when I, when they, oh, when wow. I grow up. One of the memories I have um, was I'd go to my grandparents every Sunday. And I think I must have been on a, a, one of those times we went um, and we were sort of joking around and it wasn't until something was said, I don't know what it was, about you being in danger or something like that. And then obviously one of my uncles who knew that it, you know, wasn't real, uh, mentioned that. But then my grandma was adamant that it was. You were in real danger to her. <laughs> uh, it was amazing, not just kids, but you know, all the people, because yeah. the, the CGI looked so great there. Yeah. No, thought, I, I think the best cliffhanger they did um, was in Sea Monsters when the Megalodon leaps out of the water oh, and you disappear. on the platform. Yeah. And then to be continued, that was, that was a really brilliant cliffhanger. That was, uh, yes. A megalodon is, of course, you know, everyone's favourite sea monster. Yes. And I, I, I've got the jaws from the movie or from the documentary on the side of my house. So the BBC... What, the really big one, the yeah, one you walk through the, in the show? The BBC were getting rid of them and I bought them and now they're attached to the side of my house. So oh. it's nice to have a souvenir yes, from sea those monsters. those need to be in a museum or something. Because yeah. I remember, because it started with you with a small great wide on the beach and then you walk through the big yes. one just to show the scale of it. So those ones are on my house in Somerset, on the side of my house. And that's where you get knocked in the water and then you call the guy a bloody idiot. Yeah, that's it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you idiot! If there's one dinosaur, one prehistoric creature that you could bring back to present time, what would it be? I think Microraptor. I mean, I love my, the thought of a, uh, you know, a four-winged dinosaur gliding from tree to tree, mm. eating earthworms. There's enough trouble with rewilding now, people, right. controversy about bringing back uh, leaves or, or, or <laughs> you know, or or bear. Uh, beavers are good now, so they, they, they're definitely, there's no controversy there because okay. they help the waterways. Some people don't like them, but they, 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 they stop floods, they do all sorts of things. They really aren't eco-engineers, so they're a wonderful addition to our fauna. But wolves and lynx with farmers and sheep and all of that, it's a difficult problem. So to bring back a T-Rex um, yeah. wouldn't go down too well. But a Microraptor, a lovely little um, you know, dinosaur the size of a jackdaw with feathers, mm. how great that would be. And of course, I'm sure you've read they're thinking they've got a project now to bring back a woolly mammoth. I mean, yeah. it won't really be a woolly mammoth. It will be uh, an Asian elephant that can cope with the cold. But mm -hmm. even so, to get close to a woolly mammoth, would would be brilliant but right. if i could bring anything back my favorite dinosaur from the whole prehistoric park series micro raptor favorite sea monster tanny strophius i mean that was a preposterous reptile you know with that, Is long, that long head and the, yeah, yeah and that's the one where i grab the tail. tail and and it's um lizards do it today when you know i'm sure when you were a little boy you try to catch a lizard and the tail drops off it distracts predators they go for the tail the lizard escape lots of really great paleontologists help with prehistoric park and sea monsters mm. and they found fossils with suture lines in the tail just like modern lizards oh, so they okay. know that tanny could drop the tail and that was great fun. 
I, again, I still get children writing, and you were cruel to that Tanny Stroof. Yes, yeah, you made it drop its tail, but uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I've I seen those really... comments as well. Yes, like yeah. it doesn't grow back, Nigel. Do you know? <laughs> but obviously, it, it would grow done back. Your, yeah. Done your research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've so we've talked about if you could bring one back, what would it be? And that would be the micro raptor. But there's efforts nowadays to try and make them. I mean, you, I, I assume you're aware of yes. uh, Jack Horner and his Chickenosaurus project. Yeah, yes. Um, Birds you know, with tails. Yes, yeah. or a tail that doesn't stop growing, yes. apparently. What, what are your thoughts on the efficacies of that, for instance? I think it's great. I mean, it's brilliant that we just saw a buzzard flying over. There's mm. a pigeon over there. We are actually laying eyes on the descendants of dinosaurs. They didn't become extinct, no. they transformed into birds, which is tremendous. So to actually see how that process happened by ontogenesis, ontogenesis as they're, they're doing, um, it would, would be great to see. And if they can, you know, back breed, as it were, to get a, a, a bird with a tail that never stops growing, it would be brilliant to see. I never thought about that, actually. You're right, though, because, I mean, the feathered or avian dinosaurs did eventually evolve into birds and to see that process because I'm just thinking eventually we'll get to the point where we have a Jurassic Park for instance where we have these scaly dinosaurs that maybe aren't you know accurate uh, are you a you a fan of the Jurassic Park franchise or films at all and if so what's your favorite one yeah no I enjoy them the first one of course I mean Spielberg that never been seen before things like that you know so it's great and I, I fancied Laura Dern to be honest in that movie so um, uh, yeah no uh, all honesty it, and it, I it was great, but no when when it you know in the mirror you know items may appear larger than they are yes, and, yes. and and then you know the, the the coffee the coffee vibrating when the dinosaurs are approaching I mean he's obviously an incredibly clever director um, and that that was always the best but the others are good fun if you had a chance to appear in one would you say no oh yeah no I'd definitely appear in one <laughs> if, I, if, if I got a chance to be eaten in one of those I'd definitely, <laughs> Me definitely too. do it <laughs> Me too. there was a competition not too long ago but it was only I think American uh, people who could apply for it and stuff. Yes, it's yes, a, bit, a yeah. bit unfortunate so you've been everywhere basically you've, you always film you were telling me that that you barely spend any time at home, you're always out traveling. What's been your favorite place? Oh, that's a very difficult question. I love the Philippines. I loved Guatemala. Guatemala, you know, you can walk to volcanoes and see volcanic lava streaming down the sides oh, wow. of the volcanoes. You know, not, not very difficult. Um, it's got an amazing bird called a horned guam that looks very prehistoric, you know, and it, it's, you can see why paleontologists, they're all in agreement that dinosaurs didn't become extinct, they are birds, which is which is fantastic. So whenever anyone calls me a, a geek or a nerd for watching <laughs> birds, I say, well, actually, I'm watching dinosaurs. And also, yes. a top fact is James Bond is named after a bird watcher. So if oh, you get the book, The Birds of the West Indies, the author is James Bond, and Ian Fleming was a bird watcher. He wrote the Bond book, saw that book, and named 007 after a bird watcher. So I had no we're idea. not geeks. If you if you're interested in birds as a young person, you're actually looking at dinosaurs and James Bond was named after birders. Wow. Oh, you've obviously been very fascinated by animals your whole life. How did that lead into pursuing a career in being a documentary film presenter or you know that sort of thing? How did that sort of slowly yeah, I did botany and zoology at mm -hmm. uh, Bristol University, and then um, the Natural History Unit is based there. That's obviously the Hollywood of wildlife filmmaking. I got a job there as a worm wrangler, so I caught earthworms and made them move in the right direction for the camera. And then I worked on realms of the Russian bear. I went to Kamchatka to film bears and all of those sorts of things. And at that time, ITV had lost the right to show Steve Irwin shows and they needed a British Steve Irwin, a snake wrestler. I'd never thought about being in front of the camera. I was too shy to do that. But they said, oh, can you do a reel? So I did a reel and that's how Giants happened, where I compared myself to the biggest animals alive today. I had spiders walking on my face and wrestled anacondas and all of those things and then tim haynes who'd done walking with dinosaurs saw that and he thought it would be brilliant to give scale to our creations our dinosaurs yes. let's ask nigel to do that and i remember going to a meeting the first meeting was actually as we were having the meeting the planes were going into the twin towers so oh, obviously dear. i remember exactly where i was when that tragedy 
happened and um, he said do you want to do it and of course it was the most brilliant thing that anyone had ever asked me to actually meet dinosaurs and travel back in time i went to his garden he put a tennis ball on a stick <laughs> really and he said nigel imagine that's the eye of a t-rex and talk about it and that's how it all happened so it was because of my dealing with giant animals um, in, in contemporary times was why I ended up becoming a, a time-travelling zoologist. Did you ever meet Steve Owen? You mentioned before. I, I, I met his family and they were very kind. Um, Terry said she was in the kitchen once and Steve was watching TV and he said, oh, come, come here. And it was me with Komodo dragons. I was laying next to Komodo dragons. And she says he's never done that before, but he really wow. liked your shows. I really liked his as well. So. It was great, but I never met him before the, the Stingray and a great shame because he was a brilliant conservationist. Whatever anyone mm. said about him being a showman, you need to be a showman nowadays to get wildlife seen on TV. You know, there's gardening shows, there's reality shows, there's Love Island. So <laughs> oh, you, you, need, you, need people, <laughs> yes. you need people like Steve Irwin to get people watching shows like that. And his message was always conservation. I remember him saying in Madagascar, look, we've got to do something about this because otherwise if this forest disappears, we're going to lose all these snakes and lemurs mm -hmm. and everything else I've showed you. So he, he was a great man, a great conservationist. What was your first snake then? If, if this was like your first ever time being in front of the camera and then you had to wrestle snake, do you, do you remember that first time vividly or is it a, oh, a blur now? <laughs> yeah, no, my first ever film was a producer at the BBC Naturalist Union. It was, was a snake film and we were in Kenya and I was a guy from North London who, who'd never handled a venomous snake at that time and I wanted to show that mongooses don't attack big snakes, they actually try to get them away from their territory. So I was, it, it, we were in Kenya in Savo East National Park and I saw a snake swimming by the swimming pool, crawling by the swimming pool, so I chased it into the pool to cool it down. It reared up as it came out and I realised it was a cobra. So I didn't think, wow, I'm a kid from North London. I don't know how to do it. I thought this is even better for the sequence. So I push it in again to cool it down. As it comes out, I go, and I feel all this venom on my, on my cheek. I think, oh, it's a spitting cobra, even better for the sequence. So I push it in again, try to catch it. Um, and uh, it rears up, blasts me in the eyes with oh. venom. Most extraordinary pain that, you know, like having acid poured into your eyes and I jumped into the swimming pool, washed my eyes, um, the cobra slithered off of course, I knocked on the door of the camera and look I've been you know spat at by a cobra and uh, took me to hospital, it was a three hour drive past lions, I was screaming, I completely blinded um, and I had contact lenses on so I was worried that they may damage my eyes, right. the venom may have affected them. The doctors are getting my contact lens out, as a Maasai tribeswoman is giving birth, she's screaming, I'm screaming. The baby comes out, my contact lenses come out, <laughs> uh, all was good. I was blinded for 24 hours though, so oh God. as long as you haven't got lacerations or cuts, the venom can't get into your bloodstream, so they use that as a form of defence. And right. they found that that's, that spitting, that spraying of venom evolved when early hominids evolved, so it is a defence right, against us. primates, against right. us. Right, yeah. wow. So, but it's very painful. No wonder you remember that. So were you given any training? Were you just like, here's a snake? Uh, I just go? learned on the job. Uh, and, oh, and, wow. and, and obviously I'm, you know, I stress in my films, when we go to the Philippines, I work with Filipino naturalists mm. and they appear in the films. I can't come from England and find all the wonderful things they know about. And I've learned from great herpetologists how to handle snakes. I'm a jack of all trades. I know a little bit about dinosaurs, a little bit about birds, a little bit about snakes. I'm not an expert on anything. I'm not, I didn't do paleontology at university. So there's kids at, at seven years of age that know more scientific names of dinosaurs than I do. But, um, you know, I know a little bit about everything. So speaking of, you know, dangerous incidents you've had, you just mentioned anything that happened on prehistoric park. Obviously everyone remembers when the Eurypterid, the sea scorpion, yes. got me with its pincers and children again are still writing, are you okay, did it hurt? Obviously there was false blood and it was an animatronic sea scorpion. But if you remember when I grabbed the Mononychus, this was in uh, the giant claw, so Mononychus was one that had um, ragged scale, so it was a, mm. a bird ancestor. I've got like a uh, bandage around my finger and oh. it, they, they said it was because I was bitten by the uh, uh, Mononychus or was injured by the Mononychus. In fact, what happened for one of the scenes in Giant Claw, I was climbing a tree 
and for some reason I put my boot on my finger and pulled the nail out right from the base. So obviously very painful and you had to, I was worried about infection, so they had to put a bandage on. So Tim Haynes, the director thought, oh my goodness, how can we explain this? I know, he was injured by Mononychus, but in fact, what happened was I trod on my finger and pulled the nail out. That's why I had the bandage, not because of the Mononychus. So you were climbing a tree? Climbing a tree. So how, I mean, was it like this sort of thing? Like, like I don't yeah, know how to, exactly, just yeah. like that, and when you put your foot and push. Yeah, I, it, it was it was a small tree and, 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 and my foot was as high as my, my hands and that's how it happened. That wasn't the first time you were in a tree though, because I remember seeing you hiding from, uh, it was the sarcastodon or something, the cave bear. I think it was your oh, dad. Oh yes. Hide up a tree for that one, but yeah. you were okay with that tree. Yeah, yeah. That one was most, <laughs> most trees I can climb very well, but <laughs> that one was an accident. Have you got a dangerous encounter, your most dangerous encounter, or was the spitting cobra the most dangerous? No, encounter? I think the most dangerous one everyone will remember, there's a famous discovery show called Anatomy of a Shark Bite. Um, and what happened there was I was, I was doing a film about bull sharks and I was with an expert called Eric Ritter who sadly passed away. He was guiding me, we were in the water, and he was saying, look, there's all these bull sharks around. There were two meter bull sharks. So he said, look, you know, they're not, they're not harmful, are they? Look, they can tell, they're not attacking us. And what we were going to do was put a bit of fish in my mouth. He was gonna put a heart monitor on me and the <laughs> bull shark was gonna take the fish from earth. But as we were talking, he suddenly lets out a cry. The cameraman, Pete Zuccarini, he's now gone on to do Pirates of the Caribbean, underwater cameraman, oh, was wow. filming. A shark came in and took out uh, 45 centimetres of Eric Ritter's thigh oh. in one bite. 50 square metres of blood in the water. The cameraman, camera assistant, jumped in to help pull him out. And I, I, I can always remember it. It was like you or I biting into a watermelon. It wasn't like the, the shark had injured the leg it had taken a chunk oh. out of his leg. So it was like a shot. perfect, like cartoon shape almost yeah. gone. Yeah, oh. uh, and, it, and it wasn't, you know, like a, all the other sharks skedaddled, all of this feeding frenzy stuff was nonsense. They don't know human blood. If it was a fish blood, maybe they would have all got him, but they all ran, they all swam away. He was taken to Miami in a small plane from the Bahamas and was in intensive care for three months. And they managed to rebuild his um, leg by using muscle from his buttocks. So I was standing a meter away from him in the water. So it could have easily been me. So. That was the scariest moment. Normally when we work with dangerous animals, we, we're spending a lot of time with them. So we're taking calculated risks. Yes. We know exactly. If you swim at a white shark, it will swim away from you. We know that, you know, you, and you won't go in the water with a great white shark unless it's very good visibility. You need to mm. see them, they need to see you. If I'm working with the cobra, I know how far it can strike. I know when it's getting annoyed. So I know how to deal with snakes now, but that was a very, very scary moment. And, and, you know, we wouldn't go in the water at all. If sharks wanted to get us, they've got such an array of super senses. Yeah. They can detect electricity, smell a molecule of bud in a whole swimming pool of water. So they're not out to get us. And it, it was an, an unlucky accident, but that was my most frightening moment for sure. And it didn't, it didn't happen to you though? Didn't happen to me, no, <laughs> just there. But I, you kept waking up at night thinking it could have easily yes. been. I was talking to him just a meter away. Everyone always asks, what's the most dangerous thing of filming, whether it's prehistoric park or wildlife, mm -hmm. is traveling to the location. You know, if you're in, making a film in Iran or the Philippines, right. uh, or, or in Britain where there's, you know, narrow roads and everything, the most dangerous thing is uh, driving to the location. <laughs> so you're much, more worried about driving than you are the snake or the shark. Yeah, or... <laughs> much more dangerous than the animals, the travel to the location. Is that how you started up again? <laughs> As a kid, you're like, oh, I'd love to, you know, be with Alan Grant or something. But you were doing it. You were like, yeah. that's what we would want to have done as kids with dinosaurs. You were running away from them. You were tracking yeah. them down. It was like a, not a care in the world. It was yeah. like a fantasy. It was like, oh, I wish I could uh, go along with them. Well, no egos involved. So all the mm. other people, I mean, other than Bob, the park keeper, they were just like members of the crew that were in the background. So you haven't got loads of actors. So that's why it, you know, worked really, you know, and, and they could afford to do it. So know. it was Bob Geordie. Yeah, he's he's a very he's in the uk he plays the ukulele. I think he was in Doctor Who as well. Oh, after really? that, so um, and I saw him in Avira. 
oh, recently. Oh, right, so, yeah. yeah. I'm sure he's... Ba I wouldn't see him in a play. But, you know, he's a really nice man. But, yeah, played the ukulele. And then Suzanne was a real vet. Right. Oh, she was a real vet? Yeah, she's oh. a real vet. So she was a good actor then, I guess. Yeah. She was actual vet then. <laughs> yeah, no, she, yeah, she, she was did a good. good job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only vet that's ever worked on a dinosaur. <laughs> Nigel, are you ready for our little game show, I guess, we could call it? Yeah, no, I'm not sure, but I'll try my best. I have taken a, a few quotes from your sea, Walking with Sea Monster specials, um, as well as maybe one from uh, Prehistoric Park. I'm not going to say which one. So I'm going to read these out, see if we can guess what the creature is, shall we? So, are you ready for the first one? I'm ready. One of the most grotesque predators. And look at that tail curling. That's how they get their name. There's no venom in there, and those pincers at the front. Oh, this must be the Eurypterid. The sea yes, scorpion. Yes, it is, yes. Yeah, no, of course. <laughs> and that was great. They were all coming onto the land to, like mm -hmm. horseshoe crabs do nowadays. You know, horseshoe crabs are living fossils. That's a brilliant thing to see if you ever get the chance in the eastern United States. Oh, the Masses of crabs. them. Yeah, I didn't realise those were still alive. Yeah. But they are. Yeah, they no, were... and they've, got, they've got blue blood, they've got copper in the blood, so they're an amazing living fossil. And they're all over the US. I was lucky enough to film the mass spawning once, and it's amazing. The whole beach is covered with these horseshoe crabs. So I've got to put that just, on my bucket list. Just like the sea scorpions. Yeah, no, it's well worth seeing. De Delaware Bay is a great place to see that. Are you ready for the second one? Yeah, ready. Okay. <clears throat> these fish have got these massive jaws with big sharp shears sticking out. And with that, they can cut through anything. Oh yeah, everyone's favourite, Dunkley Osteus. That's of right. Of course. <laughs> a brilliant, brilliant. I, 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 you know, of all of the, the sea monsters, that's one I'd love to have seen mm. in the wild. They're so so bizarre and quite often I do zoom calls now with um, fans and if it's children they've always got a model don't they have a little toy yeah they want me to see I, yeah. I think I have that one yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's one like it's a papo or something and it's got a little little jaw that opens and of course anyone who's watching you can also have a guess it is a surreal creature with a funny name these creatures have extraordinary horns you can tell it's a male because they splay out I That's think cool. that is my favourite mammal, actually, that I did, Ars in Ethereum. That's it, yeah. And what yeah. a great name, Ars <laughs> in Ethereum. Ars in Ethereum. I've yeah. got to think, like, is that the reason why they put that in the show? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, there, there was something, I, I saw something about it the other day. I mean, a great, a great mammal. We filmed that in Egypt. Oh, in, wow. Uh, on the Red Sea, so there was a mangrove area there, so. Uh, yeah, one of my favourites, Ars in Ethereum. <laughs> in Ethereum. Some uh, of the pronunciations were very difficult. It took me ages to be able to say Parasaurolophus. So, um, and nobody's quite sure, of course, with scientific names, yeah. how to pronounce them. But we spent a lot of time. Hopefully, I got it right. Did you see the uh, the thing about that where it supposedly could have breathed fire? There was a, there was an illustration. Um, and it must have been very early on in dinosaur discoveries where. They have this uh, parasol that's breathing fire at a carnivore. He's like, oh no! And apparently, it's something they, they thought a bit like uh, the bombardier beetle or something with its horn. Like that was where it would mix the chemicals and Whoa. splay out. Yeah, I haven't weird. seen that. <laughs> no, no it's, that, it's... that would be weird. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're doing. I thought you might have tripped up on Austin Ethereum there. Yeah, you didn't. No. They haven't got as big a brain as modern whales. They're not such social animals. In this warm water, it didn't need it. It looked for all the world like a whale on diet pills. Yeah, no, Basilosaurus, so the, the, the whale ancestor. Um, that was great using hydrophones under a boat and it was coming in close. And of course, because we've never seen one, because we can't really travel back in time, could they be dangerous? Uh, an orca has never killed a human being mm -hmm. ever, other than in captivity. Yes. They don't hit people in the wild. So mm -hmm. would Bacillosaurus, I mean, it was very primitive. Maybe you could have been chomped by it. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Well, the theory I think with uh, orcas is that maybe they're just so good at it in the wild that they cover all their tracks. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's it. They're so clever, Fiend, fiendishly clever. Yes. Yeah, no, no, they're amazing animals. Right, this one's very short because I think you'll get this one quite easily, but maybe, maybe it'll trip you up. The biggest carnivorous fish that has ever lived. 
Oh, Leeds Ichthys or no Ooh. Megalodon? Of course. Yes, you were. It is uh, kind of carnivorous, though. I mean, yeah. it's. A but I don't think it's as big as Megalodon. I'd love that's to see it. Biggest. I need to find that picture. Everyone knows my house. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Second to last one. You've got them all right so far. That is one grotesque fish. It's more like a bulldog than a fish. And this is one of my prized possessions. I've got a fossil that I got in Los Angeles. It's 95% authentic of Ziphactinus, the bulldog. Yeah, fish. yeah. They were around in ancient Texas, I don't know, 75 million years ago. In my sitting room on the wall, I have this big, this amazing fossil of Zephactinus. I've got the Megalodon jaws, Zephactinus. I like getting souvenirs of the I would too. You've done all this. It's great fun. Not long ago, um, there was somebody who had a lot of the uh, Walker with dinosaur uh, puppets and stuff, and he was selling it off, and one of them was the Bazillosaurus's head. Like almost like a trophy mount. Yeah, wow. Well. Um, was that ever used? Do you remember that at all? Because as far as I'm aware, it was all CG in in the series. So was there ever like an interaction with the with no. the head? There no, wasn't. No, not I don't remember. Definitely not, because right. I would remember that. If it was in another one of franchise, um, walking with dinosaurs or something. Oh. It, I mean it's not a dinosaur of course, but if it had been Walking in, with beasts or something. Yeah, something walking was, with yeah. beasts or something. But yeah, I, I never interacted with a Bacillosaurus head. And the final one, its name means bird mimic. I mean, this is my favourite bit. A, a technique for catching them is to slip a sock over their head and as soon as you cover their eyes they calm down. Yeah, no, this was my first meeting with T-Rex um, after I'd caught an orthonomimus. Uh, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> orthonomimus. So that was the ostrich dinosaur, a great long neck like ostriches had. To calm down an ostrich, if yeah. you ever need to do one, you do take your sock off and put it over their heads and when they're in the dark, it's like what falconers do with birds uh, of prey. They put a hood on the head. It was they suddenly ran back and the <laughs> T-Rex came after me. And that's where I did my first thing. Well, you did it. I think that, that's all of them. Maybe the Megalodon or the Orthonomimus, especially Arsenotherium. Might have tripped you up that one because yeah, that was no. only a brief second, really, yeah. when you're on land. But congratulations. I'm looking more impressive than I am, <laughs> but I, I can remember the prehistoric beasts that I met in sea monsters or uh, prehistoric part, or most of them anyway. I feel honoured that, you know, what, you know, thank you for obviously taking the time out of your busy schedule because it, it is a busy schedule, like you previously mentioned, uh, to meet with me. And I also feel like there's, there's a lot of people out there that if they could have the chance to say anything to you, you know, to give them a, a sort of a voice. So I put it out on YouTube, asked uh, for some comments, and we've, we've got a few here. If you don't mind answering some questions. No, of course not. So uh, this is from Dead Evil Mason, who says, he's literally my inspiration for everything dinosaurs. I'd probably just ask him how he got into the position of being, or able to do, dinosaur TV shows, and like what things he studied and places he worked at to get there. I really wasn't a dinosaur fan when I was a kid. You right. know, I'm, I'm amazed at the kid, what the kids know nowadays. Um, I was always into reptiles and creepy crawlies. But because I did the series Giants, where I met the biggest animals alive today, mm -hmm. the makers of Walking with Dinosaurs said, this is a great guy to go back and meet dinosaurs. And then I really started getting interest in them. I am so elated, I'm so thrilled to get questions like that because I have inspired paleontologists to start studying at university or whatever because they saw prehistoric park when they were children and, and, and that's brilliant. If my enthusiasm can get people fired up about paleontology, uh, even though I'm not a paleontologist myself, yeah. That's brilliant stuff. Question number two comes from Loco. I think I'm saying that right. What was his favorite moments while filming those, all those shows, including sea monsters, chased by uh, dinosaurs, prehistoric park, and primeval? Uh, also, thanks to Nigel making my childhood awesome. Yeah, it's a difficult one because it was all good fun. So every episode of prehistoric park took about 30 days to film. It wasn't in a studio, it was in a natural environment. Yeah. So Fraser Island in Australia was perfect. Fraser Island, my first ever filming with Tim Haynes. That was when I ran across sand dunes with a breeding colony of Protoceratops and I'm waving the red <laughs> flag and we're talking about color vision in dinosaurs. I think that was my favorite. And Fraser Island was a brilliant place to stay. I remember there's a lake in the middle. I went swimming there. Um, snorkeling there and you could catch snake neck turtles um, oh, wow. for, for real and obviously let them go so that was great there was dingoes on the beach there big swarms of red crabs so 
uh, you know, it was great fun doing the filming and Fraser Island was a fantastic place to stay. Number three, we've kind of got two here because um, they kind of cover the same thing. Uh, King Drakkar says, if we, or if you had the choice, uh, would he bring back Prehistoric Park? I'm assuming that is the series. And Aerox says, I'd ask if he'd ever consider doing another season of Prehistoric Park or maybe even a spin-off. I would love before I retire to do another time travelling series. It won't be Prehistoric Park, there'll never be a Prehistoric Park 2 because that name is owned by Impossible Pictures and they don't want to do a sequel. They moved on to doing Primeval right. uh, and things like that. But, you know, I'm hoping Netflix or Amazon or Apple TV, because they're so popular, because they're looking for family entertainment, yeah. would do another one. A time travelling series, yes, and it could easily be like Prehistoric Park, but it just won't have that name. Oh, thank Christ for that. Great. Just roll. Oh, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> he looks turned it back on there. Oh, will he? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Hopefully not. Has he turned it off before yet? No. Oh, no, so that could be the end. Prehistoric Park. I get, I get yeah, confused yeah. with the kingdom that you're yeah, doing yeah, now yeah, as well. Yeah, Prehistoric Park. Um, at the very end, they, they sort of leave it on a little bit of a cliffhanger to say until his next adventure and you're you're pointing at something on the desk and then you obviously you go through the time pole but i saw that the the dinosaur that's in front of you or prehistoric creature i should say is a quetzal or some sort of pteranodon so was there ever any like season two on the cards for a something like that or was that just something that was thrown together for the ending i wanted to do it but itv didn't want another one and right. all of the producers moved on to do other projects so that that was the the shame of there's so many dinosaurs and new dinosaur discoveries that we could include i've never met a spinosaurus just imagine snorkeling Ooh. with those new theories about spinosaurus being under the water and everything would be totally fantastic. I'd love, everyone remembers the sequence when I'm in a microlight flying with pterosaurs. Yeah. I'd love to do more of that, love to go into the details of, of flying reptiles. There's so much more to do and I really hope that, um, you know, there, there'll be a chance to make another series. Well, definitely bringing you into it adds that sense of scale. And it's it's very easy because, I, I mean, I've played dinosaur games and when it's, when it's just dinosaurs walking about, you don't know the scale, like, oh, well, he's big because he's a little bit bigger than me. But when you see a person, your, your whole scale gets changed. You're like, oh, okay, that's how big yeah. that is because you've yeah. got something you can draw to in real life. Uh, we've got here Kjors Zor. My question would be, what's his favorite time period? Uh, it can be eras or periods, etc. cetera. Uh, Mesozoic, Cambrian period, all that. I think um, Carboniferous, the age of insects was fantastic. To see Arthur Pleura, there's incontrovertible evidence that Arthur Pleura was in prehistoric Scotland. If you go to the Isle of Arran, there's trackways just above the high tide, so to see a millipede that was as long as I'm tall, nearly two metres, would be fantastic. Not for some people, though. I think the giant spider might put some people yeah. off. <laughs> uh, the king of spooky, the final question we got here. How the hell did you survive getting swarmed by that Mosasaur family? Yeah, no, we're, <laughs> again, we're good. Here I am, speaking to you. Movie secrets. So I'm very excited about the new New things coming up, you know, prehistoric kingdom, as you yes, say. Yes, yes, that's true. First time I've been in a dinosaur game, so that I'm very excited about. There's a great team working on that. Through the power of genetic technology, biological marvels from a bygone era roam the earth once more. And um, I'm going to be in a Minecraft game, Nigel yeah, and the Dinosaur. Mod, yeah. Done the, vo the voiceover <laughs> for that. Join me as I travel back in time 95 million years to what will one day become the Huancul formation of Argentina. I'll, I'll be really hip then if, you, <laughs> if, you're in a mine, if you're in a Minecraft game, that's what I really want to well, do. Well, Minecraft never ages, it's always in. Yeah. You'll no, be down I'm, with the cool I'm, kids. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, know, when seeing. that releases, I'll definitely cover it on the channel. Yeah. No. Or if we can get you to play it, maybe, that would be quite interesting. Yeah, no, it would be. <laughs> it would be. And if there's anything that, any shout outs that you want to give or where people can find you, say it. Yeah, if you, if you want to um, go to nigelmarvin.com, there's lots there about, or Nigel on Twitter, at Nigel Marvin. Lots there. You can come and meet me. I do wildlife weekends in Devon. You can have a one-to-one -one zoom call with me from anywhere in the world you know i can do messages for birthdays with zifactinus <laughs> in the background the fossil so be great to um you know contact you but nigelmarvin.com or at nigelmarvin or on instagram nigelmarvinofficial 
that's the way to get me. Well, thank you. It's been lovely Thanks so talking much. to you. And if you've enjoyed this video, do check out Nigel Marvin at all his Twitters, Instagrams. And until next time, join the video, leave a like, and I'll see you later. Oh, bye bye. Oh yes, that's me. I'll take the uh, the microphone off you. Yeah, that's that's a good thing not to forget. <laughs> yes. They're expensive, yeah, these, yeah. aren't they?